All right, so here we are for our after school review on literature. Uh, this is eight push. And again, as, I, as I've said earlier, we're looking at um, the, the cultural aspects that are changing in America, how literature developed, how it developed in different time periods, and how it was reflective of the time periods that it was in. So with that in mind, we'll start with the earliest time period for writing in America, and that's actually what we would call Puritan period, right? The Puritan period. We may remember that uh, not a, there are no novels being written in America at this time period. There's no great uh, short stories. But when the Puritans came to America, they came in the Great Migration starting in 1630. Remember, they were much more devoted to education than any of the other groups that had come before them or even a little bit after them. Because of their uh, love of education, it led them to develop a lot of things. Schools in America. What was the first school developed in America? Harvard. Harvard, exactly. The Puritans. We get a series of poems that are going to be written at this time period. Many diaries. Do you remember the pamphlet wars we talked about? Right, especially between Roger Williams, who was a dissenter, and he would attack certain practices. And then, of course, other people would attack him back. I believe it was John Cotton would attack him back with pamphlets. So a lot of pamphlets are being written at this time period. And a lot of very important sermons. Because, you know, again, the Puritans are very religious. Uh, very utilitarian or very personal mostly deeply, deeply religious. But again, some very important things are happening, right? In 1630, when they first come over, who wrote Model of Christian Charity? Jonathan Winthrop. Jonathan Winthrop. Exactly. And he has the famous quote, we shall be as a city upon a hill. Right? So here's this idea of individuals who have to work together, labor together, toil together, suffer together, he says. Right? They're coming to a new world where there, there are no established cities or towns, there are no established uh, churches or schools, none of that. It's pure wilderness. So the model of Christian charity was very important to try to motivate people. Now we don't have any actual proof that he ever actually read this out loud. We know it was written aboard the, uh, the Arabella, which is the boat he came over on in 1630. There are no diary records so far that suggest anyone actually heard him give the speech. We know he did write it because they, uh, after his death, they go to his son and they want to include this in the history of Massachusetts. So we do know it's out there. Later on, this really influences a lot of American thought. Even today, right, a lot of presidents over the years, we'll quote that city upon a hill. It's come to mean a lot of different things in time. Right? Both the Democratic and Republican Party will look at this as America being a shining beacon to the world. Not what Winthrop originally intended, but that's what's become to us in our history. The Bay Psalms, 1640. Uh, the first written piece of music in the Americas. This, these psalms are... Um, or a songbook, right? Puritans, this was the Puritan songbook. This was very important to them. Music of a religious nature was very important to them. Later on, this period goes all the way into the uh, time of the First Great Awakening. Another very, very important sermon is Sitters in the Hands of an Angry God. Who wrote that? Jonathan Edwards, right? Jonathan Edwards. He talked about. God hangs you over a pit like you would a spider over a fiery pit. This is this fire and brimstone, very, very emotional appeal type of sermons that are being given now. But these are written and they're published. They're published in pamphlet form normally. You get other men like uh, George Whitfield, another very important minister of the time period, James Davenport. Right? A lot of these men are writing these various pamphlets and sermons. But again, it's influencing, it's influencing our thinking. 
It's influencing the way we think of culture and society, early colonial period through the mid-1700s. So we call this the Puritan period. They were the ones who probably produced the most writing at this time period. There's going to be some pamphlets written in the South, some in the middle states, and the middle colonies, I should say. Uh, but mostly it's going to be from the Puritan society we get this. We get that famous letter in the uh, 1723, Cotton Mather writes a series of letters that deal with inoculation, right? A series of letters that are written back and forth. Those are all published in newspapers. Then we move from the, this period into the next period. I'll eventually get to move. Ah, there we go. The Enlightenment period. The Enlightenment is happening in Europe, and it's influencing America. But writing is changing now. We're leaving the strictly religious arena of the Puritans and going more into this political, logical, scientific area of the Enlightenment. There are a lot of political thinkers in England. Uh, John Locke is one that will very much influence American thought. Thomas Hobbes. John Locke developed natural rights. Thomas Hobbes, uh, the social contract. A lot of this will come to America, influence the way um, these, this new generation of Americans begin to think and how they write. Benjamin Franklin, right, considered the first American. Right? He was started the first volunteer fire uh, station. He created the first library in America. Right? He invented the stove. He invented the lightning rod. He invented bifocals. Discovered the properties of electricity. Right? He didn't discover lightning, he didn't discover electricity. They already knew about that. He starts to understand the very nature of it in his famous kite experiments. His famous piece of work is Poor Richard's Almanac. Does anybody remember what an almanac is? Like a calendar, book of knowledge. It's a, like a calendar, book of knowledge. Like Who especially want almanacs? Farmers, right? Because there's a lot of information in an almanac that will deal with when it's time to plant, when it's time to water, when it's time to harvest, right? Uh, the cycles of the moon, right? The phases, the various phases of the moon are in an almanac. What is different, though, about poor Richard's almanac? There's jokes. Well, jokes, we could say there are jokes there. He, he's going to set out to entertain us. We're going to get a lot of these worldly sayings, right? A penny earned, or a penny saved is a penny earned, right? Things like that. Uh, so early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right? And there's little stories in here about poor Richard, about his life. And it becomes a huge bestseller. Between 32 and 1758, he is publishing this book. It made Benjamin Franklin quite wealthy. He's also famous, though, prior to him getting involved in printing this book, when he was a very young man, perhaps as 12 or even 13 years of age, he wrote a series of letters. The silence, do good letters, yes. So here's a guy who's very used to writing in a way to both uh, entertain us and also give us a sense of thinking about what's going on. Of course, Thomas Jefferson's famous Declaration of Independence, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, the Federalist Papers. Again, all of this stuff is of a political nature. The great writing in America this time period is all political. Uh, Jefferson, in 1775, wrote a book called The Necessities of Picking Up Arms, Weapons, right? The necessity of, of fighting and defending for yourself against the British. So much of the pamphlets written at this time period, much of the uh, information is all political in nature. Who wrote the Federalist Papers? Madison. Hamilton, John Madison. James Madison, and John Jay. 85 essays, again, to help us to understand the Constitution they've just written. Again, this is the type of nature of the, most of the pamphlets that are being written at this time period. But America eventually will emerge as a nation and want to have its own identity. 
America will start thinking about its own history, its own culture. Right, right now, we're basically a culture of displaced Englishmen with a few scattered Germans and French. There is actually some Polish people in America at the time period, but mostly of English descent. After the War of 1812, we get into this new moment when American literature, American lit literature begins to explode. There was an old saying, no one reads an American book until after the War of 1812. We start getting more and more individuals who are interested in now becoming their own writers and writing about an American experience. The War of 1812 gave us a sense of nationalism for the first time in our history. So new writers in America begin to emerge. This is during the Romantic period. Uh, in our art history, we, uh, our lesson, we talked about the Romantic period. That was the, Ri the Hudson River School. We talked about that the other day, actually yesterday in the class, the Hudson River School. Just like in art, literature also followed in the Romantic period. Very personal. Or it's, it's actually a move from the personal political documents to more entertainment. Real American themes. And one of the first group of people collectively are known as the Knickerbocker Group. Where is the where is where would you find Knickerbockers? New York. New York. You ever heard of the New York Knicks? Yeah. They're actually the New York Knickerbockers. That comes from a, this famous writer, Washington Irving. Right? Um, he does what we would almost consider today a viral campaign. You know what a viral campaign is? Something's gone viral. You guys live in the electronic age. You know what it means to go viral, right? Yeah. What? It, yeah, yeah. What does it mean? Like a hit video on everyone's. Yeah, you get a video out there and it just goes crazy, right? Well, he doesn't have video in his time period, but he does have newspapers. He puts an ad in a newspaper. Has anyone seen Dietrich Knickerbocker? It starts off as this newspaper story. Has anyone seen Dietrich Knickerbocker? And he starts to go on uh, this little journey through the newspaper. He starts saying, puts ads in the newspaper that he's the owner of a hotel or, a, or, or an inn where someone would stay. And um, don't, I wouldn't worry about this. You're going to be able to see this later on. You're, 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 you're getting a little anxious there. Okay, just calm. I'm not going to be able to sit here if you're going to be going jumping around trying to see over me. Don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, so he puts this ad in the newspaper. Has anyone seen Dietrich Knickerbocker? And then he starts running these ads. Uh, I'm the owner of an inn. Uh, he's left behind this sketchbook. Or actually, no, yeah, History of New York. He's left behind this book. He's called The History of New York. He is... He's left my inn. He has not paid his bills. I have no idea where he's at. The mayor of New York gets involved. The constables, the type of police of the day, get involved. They're trying to find this guy. They're putting up wanted posters, missing posters. Have you seen Dietrich Knickerbocker? Who is Dietrich Knickerbocker? Knickerbocker. Turns out there is no such person. Right? But he got everyone thinking about this history book of New York. And it became a bestseller, right? That's today we would do it as a viral campaign. People would put out a video to get themselves out there, and all of a sudden every uh, media outlet would have that video today, right? Like what's that? Where everyone does that dance, the Harlem Shake. Okay. Right? Those are viral, right? Someone puts that out there. A famous basketball team like the Heat. I've seen even the boys lacrosse team has done one. You know. Everyone, everyone wants to get their message out there. We do it via the internet today. He did it via the newspapers of his time period. He's very famous, though, Washington Irving, for his book called The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, Gent. It's a series of 34 essays and short stories. It's 34 essays and short stories. 
And the, the two most famous that I'm sure you've heard of before, uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Heard of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow? Yes. The Headless Horseman? Have you heard that story? Yeah. 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 How about Rip Van Winkle? Yeah. The man who slept for 100 years? Mm -hmm. Those are two of the more famous of this particular book. He wrote it in England. In fact, he wound up staying much of his life in England, but his writings start to become very popular in England and later in France. One of the first Americans who will sell his work to Europe. Right? This is the beginning of an American sense of writing. Uh, James Fenimore Cooper, another very popular guy, also very much like the other day we talked about the Hudson River School, that there actually was, there's no such thing as an actual building where you go to school. The same thing with the Knickerbocker Group. There was no actual meeting of these people. They all come out of New York, and hence they start calling them collectively the Knickerbocker Group. And the two most famous are Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper. He was complaining to his wife one day that he could write a better book. He was reading these books, and he, was, he wasn't happy with them. So his wife got tired of him saying, oh, I could write a better book. She said, well, then write a better book. And he wrote a series of books that are collectively known as the Leather Stocking Tales. They're books. These are actual books. He published his first in 1823. 1841 is when he published his last one. The most famous is Last of the Mohicans. Has anybody ever seen that movie or ever heard that movie a few years ago it came out? Daniel Day-Lewis, who played Abraham Lincoln. Is it that movie? What's important here, and I want you to write this down, I want you to know this. What James Fenimore Cooper does, he takes an actual history moment. He takes the French-Indian War. Right? The setting is the French and Indian War, an actual moment in history. And he puts fic fictional characters into it. This is something that becomes very American after a while. We'll take real historical events. Or later on we'll talk about we'll just simply put you in the real world. We don't have to have a real event take place, but we'll just have you in the real world and put fictional characters and how they interact. Uh, Natty Bumko is the hero of all these stories. Natty, his name is Natty Bumko, nicknamed in the book Hawkeye. Uh, he's known as Hawkeye. He's a white man who's raised by Indians. Right? And it's his, how he went through life himself. Most people believe that Natty Bumko character is based off of the real life Daniel Boone. Have you ever heard of a guy named Daniel Boone? What's that? He's the guy who went to the Cumberland Gap. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Very good. All right, so this is the beginning, again, of American type of literature. It's coming out of the European movement of Romanticism, but it's affecting Americans. And Americans now want to have their own identity and start writing their own books. Staying in this are some other famous people who also come out of this time period. Edgar Allan Poe. How many of us have heard of Edgar Allan Poe? Raise your hand. Good. Everyone's raising their hand. Good. Uh, short story in the modern detective novels. The Telltale Heart, right? You ever hear of the Telltale Heart? Yeah. Right? The thump, 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 and he just can't take it anymore, right? Uh, uh, can you tell me, name me another one? The Raven. The Raven, right? And the what? I, Annabelle. Annabelle. Annabelle Lee, the poet. Okay, yes. What else? The cast of Montiago. The cast of Montiago. Cast of Montiago, right? Isn't there all something uh, about the, the, the death? Mask um, of the Red Death. Mask of the Red Death, yes. It's been a long time since I've read Poe, but I, I used to like Poe a lot. There was, wasn't there, doesn't he have a story about the monkey's foot? Yeah. 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 All right. They're also scary in nature sometimes, but there, there's a lot of detective work that goes on in here. Now, a guy like him, he's writing in this romantic era, but he's not interested in human goodness or social progress. He's interested in really this, you know, this seedier side of life, if you will. Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter. Have any of us had to read that yet in school? The Scarlet Letter. You read it for fun? I don't know if they read that in school anymore. But Daniel Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter, 
is about the Puritan society. And you have this woman, she's a married woman, and she commits adultery. Wow. And the scarlet letter is an A. She has to wear an A on her clothing, right? So here he's writing about, and it, it's a made-up story. It's not a real story, but he's writing about what American society was like in the early goings of our history. Again, it's a way of kind of looking back at ourselves and judging our society in, this, in that situation through the eyes of strict Puritan religion. Right? We always use those expressions, you're very Puritan-like, uh, you know, it's the Puritan work ethic, and he's writing about that. And in Herman Melville, wrote a very famous book that a lot of people haven't heard of anymore, it's called Moby Dick. How many of us have heard of Moby Dick, the book? Oh, good, good, good. They call, or no, call me Ishmael, that's how the book starts. And Ishmael is a guy who's on the boat that's no longer around, and it's about this, this captain, right? Captain Ahab, as he's, he is so driven to find this one particular white whale. Right, this one particular white whale. This is very important in early American history because this was a huge industry in America, whaling. Whaling was a big, big industry, and we, we relied so much on whale. Uh, whale blubber, we got oil from it. Much of our early kerosene was uh, derived from whale blubber. Uh, we, we ate it. We used this carcass for various materials. Whaling was a huge, huge industry in the United States. So this book, Moby Dick, would appeal to many, many people. Transcendentalism is sort of an offshoot of Romanticism. It's a pseudo-religious philosophy that uh, develops here in mostly the, uh, the Northeast area. Transcendentalism rides out of the uh, Puritan theology. Uh, the German Romantics, the Romanticism that was plain of the day, and also Asian religious thought, Hinduism, Buddhism. And it was like a, a spirituality, right? You know, people can either be religious, they attend a church service, or they can be spiritual and try to become like one with nature. And that's what transcendentalism is sort of like. The idea that your conscience can transcend Right? It can move beyond your, your basic five senses. What are your five senses? Sight, Sight smell, hearing, hearing taste, touch. touch. Right? We can transcend those things. Right? That's what transcendentalism is about. We can experience real truth. Right? And, uh, the senses and, and logical reason, they're better guides to truth than just your five senses or just logical reading, reasoning. <clears throat> Ralph Waldo Emerson is often considered one of the first leaders of this movement, a poet, a writer himself. Self-reliance, improvement, confidence, and freedom. But the guy who's the most famous is actually his disciple, Henry David Thoreau. Walden is his most famous book, uh, The Idea of Civil Disobedience. Right? You can speak out against your government. What famous American of the 20th century was highly influenced by this? Gandhi. American. Martin, Martin Luther King. Gandhi also is influenced, but for as far as America is concerned, Dr. King, very influenced by this. Walt Whitman, another famous poet. Leaves of Grass is his most famous, but Oh Captain, My Captain. Uh, that's a poem about the death of Abraham Lincoln. Walt Whitman was also a nurse during the Civil War. Walk over here for a second. I'm thirsty. And again, remember, this is all being videotaped, so. If I go too fast, don't worry. You'll be able to go back online and see it again. The realism period will now hit the United States. 
Look at the date, 1865. What do you remember about that date? The Civil War, the Civil War is what? Over. Over. All right, it's come to an end. Did someone say started? <laughs> no, it's come to an end. Remember, what, what was the biggest thing that Americans, both North and South, collectively, you know, mourned over? Death. Death on one of the largest scales Americans had ever known, right? 620,000 plus deaths in the war, plus unknown number of civilians who also died. The number could easily be up to a million individuals. So we come out of that era of the Civil War, people don't want to be romanticizing about the past. Right? People are becoming more and more logical. They want realism in their life. They want to get away from that sentimentality. They want to hear stories that appeal to them now. No one did it better than Mark Twain. Mark Twain is probably the one guy who typifies this period in America. Now, realism, again, it's in Europe. In fact, it starts in Europe, but it's something that's very important to America. He wrote, in the plain speak of the people, which oftentimes made his characters seem very illiterate. And he wrote about subjects you know, that were very satirical, but very to the point. Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer. These are young men who often get themselves in these adventures, but they're also getting in a lot of trouble. He wrote the book The Gilded Age, right? Where he just he's tired of the time period you're living in. Everything looks like it's so nice, but underneath it's really quite corrupt. I always find it interesting with someone like Kate Choplin. Every now and again, you've got someone who comes along that is never really appreciated in their lifetime. And that's Kate Choplin's The Awakening. Um, a lot of social taboos in this book. A lot of social taboos. She's a married woman, uh, not quite happy with her life. And it's this awakening experience that she has. In the time period it came out, People really didn't want to read it. It became more popular in the late 1950s and throughout the 1960s during those countercultural and, and the sexual revolution and things like that. It became more popular 60, 70 years after it was written. Louise May Alcott. How many of us have read Little Women? See, that's not the rite of passage anymore. It used to be every little girl read Little Women. A very influential book in American history. Again, it's just a, a simple, realistic story of a family. She followed up with a book called Little Men. And then after that, I think it was called Joe's Boys. It was the last of her books that she wrote. Louise May Alcock, as a young person, her parents lived with the Transcendentalists. So she grew up, you know, at the feet at, at uh, Henry David Thoreau. Basically, he was one of her teachers. By the turn of the century, we're going into the progressive era now. And we're getting to this thing called naturalism, which is an outgrowth of realism. Here are the novelists of the 19th and the early decades of the 20th, right? Instead of simply telling realistic stories, they also like to put people in, in these very sad, terrible predicaments and really kind of show that life can be harsh. But life, can, you can also overcome things. Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. He's writing about a young man in the Civil War who is a coward at first and runs away. Your Red Badge of Courage is standing and getting shot. Right? And he comes back to realize that. And he overcomes his own sense of fear. You got Jack London in The Call of the Wild. Every young boy wanted to read that. You know, teenage angst of the Gilded Age, early progressive era just kind of running away, getting away from your sad existence and going to Alaska and run with the wolves. And Upton Sinclair writes The Jungle in this period. Right? Remember The Jungle. 
people are falling in your hamburgers. You're eating a hamburger and you're like, hmm, that's kind of crunchy. Oh, that's a toenail. Remember, people read the jungle. They didn't get the idea they were supposed to feel sorry for the workers. They got sorry for what? No. Themselves. They were eating contam contaminated meat. You never knew what actually was in a hot dog. We still don't know always what's in a hot dog, do we? <laughs> You're kind of taking a risk. What? Why does it plump when you cook it? What's that? How uh, Roosevelt to pass the... The, the... the Pure Food and Drug and Meat Inspection Acts okay. eventually come out of that, yes. But again, we're in an era getting ready to get into progressivism, where Americans are starting to look at the way society is. A lot of immigrants are coming to America. We also know we could throw in Jacob Riss' How the Other Half Lived, 1890. Right? He's looking at, that's a photograph book. He's thinking about how uh, immigrants have to live in horrible conditions in these giant urban cities. Americans are starting to get a little bit concerned about this. They're getting concerned at democracy. Immigrants are, the new immigrants are coming. They have no experience in democracy. They don't know how to vote. They're coming from dictatorships. They're actually, they're coming from monarchies, the old monarchies. And, and they're, they're coming from places that America doesn't even know even exist. And so there's a sense of, well, what's going to happen to democracy in this country? So this idea of the hapless human as a victim, right, that plays well with these types of books. Because Americans aren't sure at the turn of the century what's really going to happen. As we get closer and closer towards World War I, right, and then when World War I outbreaks, it becomes kind of even more so. This idea is the whole world going to consume itself. Literature will change, and literature will change after World War I especially. We get the lost generation of writers come on to play. These are writers that come from various ethnic and regional backgrounds. And World War I defined them. They saw either the death or they saw the hypocrisy of society. All these great societies that were willing to decay and destroy themselves in the war. I've got these two very famous American writers of the time, but there are others as well. F. Scott Fitzgerald. This side of paradise, right? All gods dead, all wars fought, all faiths in man shaken. Do you think that's influenced by World War I? Just that quote alone? Do you see how that's influenced? You know, people died on a large scale. In one single battle, the Battle of the Somme, one million human beings died. These writers are going to reflect this type of apathy and a sense of helplessness and hopelessness that they feel. The Great Gatsby, right? There's a movie coming out now, right? The Great Gatsby, right? The glamour and cruelty that we see in society. The Roaring Twenties, they come, come right after World War I, right? The Roaring Twenties seem like this great time period, but there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of cruelty that takes place. There are a lot of people who are the haves that beat down the people who have the have-nots. And these writers want to reflect that. Ernest Hemingway, here's a man who actually went to war. He went and saw what war was like firsthand. So his writing is very influenced by the war. He saw the propaganda of patriotism at the time period. Every nation wanted to say they were better than the other nation. That's nationalism. So they were so willing to kill each other. So he writes one of his famous books, The Sun Also Rises, the disillusioned expatriates, these Americans that were living in France at the time, and the outbreak of the war, a farewell to arms, Again, this is when he was uh, serving in Italy during some of the Italian campaigns. 
some famous poets of the day, T.S. Eliot and Gertrude Stein. Also, a lot of their poetry is also reflective of this time period, the 1920s. It's supposed to be this great roaring decade. But all these writers are saying, look at what we've just done to ourselves. How do we heal those scars of the war? Regionalism. Regionalism is something that becomes very important to American writers once we get past into the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, this idea of writing about places that you're from. Making your novels more regional. Right? I'm from Oklahoma. I'm going to write about Oklahoma. Men like William Faulkner, The Sound and the Fury, and As I Lie Dying, Again, he's from the South. His themes are about the South. You got a Sinclair Lewis. He's a chronicler of Midwestern life. Main Street and Babbitt are two very famous, important books in history, again, about that life out in the West. And in Harlem, right, and it, which is up New York City area, right, Harlem, you have a Harlem Renaissance that's going to take place, right? Black culture will explode in America during this time period. That's also regionalism. This is where jazz music really comes of age. There are writers like Langston Hughes. He's a writer. He's going to write about his experiences as a black man out of Harlem. A huge cultural explosion for black America, which will influence white teenagers all the way through the rock and roll era. Uh, yesterday I talked to you about the painting American Gothic, if you were here yesterday. Right? Um, that's all. Art also reflected regionalism at this time period. What is America going through in the late 20s and throughout the 30s? The Great Depression. Right? People are going through the Great Depression. You think a lot of people want to travel during this time period, go on vacations? No. So regionalism, the idea of where you're from. So a lot of people are basically in the 30s and 40s sort of trapped in their existence. Art reflects life. Right? So this is why regionalism became very popular in the 20s, and especially in the 30s and even into the 40s. And there's probably no better uh, example of regionalism for us than uh, John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath. How many of us have read The Grapes of Wrath? Have you had to read that in school yet? Or do you have you read that anymore? Have you heard of The Grapes of Wrath? Of Mice and Men? You, yeah. Of yeah. Mice and Men? Yeah. Same author, right? Again, not only is the Depression happening, but what else is happening? Yeah. What drought? The Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl. So regionalism, right? He's going to write about these Okies from Oklahoma, and their, their struggles that they have. Should they go to California or not? Many Okies are leaving and going to California to pick peas. Is that the better life, or should they stick it out? Should they hope that eventually the Dust Bowl will end, rain will come, and better days are ahead, or should they go too? The struggle of the human mind and heart and soul is taking place in the Grapes of Wrath. Of mice and men, they're migrants trying to find work. And you got the two guys, you know, one's trying to take care of the other, right? Uh, George and Lenny, right? Poor George. He gets to look at the rabbits. <laughs> Now, 
But you see, this is the kind of story that would appeal to Americans at this time period. Because America under, is very much understanding the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression. People have lost their homes. People have lost their jobs. Uh, people are hoping that there is a hope. What president is trying to bring hope? FDR, right? What is his domestic policy called? The New Deal. So you've got some underlying this as well. Should we go away? Should we go? Is there hope for us? The New Deal's on the horizon. Right. Regionalism would be a, a good way to kind of highlight that. After you get out of World War II, another new mindset was going to switch in America. We're into the modern age. People should be excited. You've just won World War II. You should be very excited. But writers always kind of look at things a little bit different. And they see a lot of disillusionment after World War II as well. There are a lot of things that aren't necessarily as rosy as we'd like to think. Joseph Keller writes a very funny book about being in the Army, Catch-22. Uh, it's about experiences being in World War II. You'd like to get out of battle. The only way you can get out of battle is to claim you're crazy. But if you're able to explain that you're crazy, then you can't be crazy. Catch-22. It's a paradox. Right? So life in the military is kind of not an easy life. Most of these guys are flying bomber missions you think it'd be a little crazy to drop bombs on people while someone's trying to shoot you out of the air? Yeah, you know, you're going to be a little crazy anyways. But if you claim you're crazy, then you kind of understand that. So the Catch-22 sets in. Kurt uh, Vonnegut Jr., Slaughterhouse-5. Right? Also a World War II setting, but also about time travel. Billy Pilgrim. Right? Is he... What's that? The Tropomodorians. Yeah, what, what, what's going on with this guy? He's, he winds up all of a sudden in the future. He winds up in the past. Some guy wants to kill him. Right, so there's some time travel. There's some elements here of science fiction starting to come into our writing. I don't have up here, I should have him. Also, Ray Bradbury is another science fiction writer. We're going to the Cold War era now. We're all afraid of Russians dropping atomic bombs. We're afraid that we're going to drop atomic bombs. So all of a sudden, uh, science fiction kind of takes off. Sylvia Plath kind of chronicles her own falling into deep, deep depression. The bell jar. Right? She, is, she in real life is spiraling into a deep depression. And she is basically writing about this but putting it in a, in a fictional spin. It's the only book she'll ever write. Shortly after its uh, publication in London, she commits suicide. Right. Issues like depression, right? clinical depression, we've never really talked about that stuff before. And here you get a book that will be published in the early 60s that will first kind of shine a light on clinical depression. What is this? Right. We don't really have a name for this sort of stuff yet. So these writers are bringing this out. Arthur, Arthur Miller, right, the Crucible. What is happening when he writes this book? McCarthyism. The McCarthyism, McCarthy era. It's about the Salem witch trials, but he and he can't really expose, you know, Joseph McCarthy. So he does it through a fictional book about the Salem witch trials, right? So it's an allegory about that. Betty Friedan is going to write the Feminine Mystique. Right? The problem that has no name. What is, what is wrong when all we're trying to do is simply get married and then lose our identity and our husbands? Right? The feminine mystique. This begins the feminist movements in America. And like the beginning of Teenage Rebellion with J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Again, he, the only book he ever wrote, then he went into seclusion. Catcher in the Rye. Has anybody ever read that book? Few of you. That's an interesting read. <laughs> it originally, when this book was originally, uh, when he when he originally wrote it and had it published, it was only for adults. These are very adult themes. What happens to this young man who runs away? But it has now become uh, 
very important for teenagers to read. It, it's the beginning of Teenage Rebellion, Catcher in the Rye. Again, very new kinds of themes. Today, in our modern world, who knows what we're living in. There's Gothic writing, there's fantasy writing, there's romance, there's Twilight, <laughs> there's Harry Potter, right? There's all kinds of crazy types of writing out there today. We don't really have the type of, well, this is a genre that is reflecting society. It kind of reflects all different types of things in society at any particular moment, but not, not like it used to be, but still a lot of fun, a lot of new stuff out there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you coming. And that is now the end of our lesson on literature. We're going to applaud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.